I can't seem to focus, and you don't seem to notice I'm not here. I'm just a mirror. You check your complexion to find your reflections all alone. I had to go. Can't you hear me? I'm not coming home. Do you understand? I've changed my plans, cause I, I'm in love with my future, can't wait to meet her, and I But not with anybody else. Just wanna get to know myself. I know supposedly I'm lonely now. No, I'm supposed to be unhappy without some. Side. Mama says it's gonna get cold in the night, but if I picture you, then I'll be alright. I am ready. I am ready for you to be here. It's been a little while since I held your hand, so my arms won't stretch to your distant lines. Give me every person in the whole wide world And I'll pick you out in a second Girl, I am ready I am ready For you to be here For you Hello, everybody. 
This is 10 p.m. Pacific Standard Time coming at you from Vancouver. This is Mark Kwan, your late night DJ of Late Night Coffee Show Live, where things are unfiltered, uncensored, and coming at you live. All right. Um, it's 10 p.m. here. If you guys can shout out uh, what city you're from and what your time zone is, because I'd like to know. Uh, some of you were joining uh, last time from like midnight time zone, so I really do appreciate it. Uh, tonight's <coughs> topic is um, maybe not so much popular because it's not really everybody's cup of tea, but those of you who are doing full arches or who are attempting to do full arches or who are thinking about doing full arches or just simply wondering what full arch implant therapy is like these days uh, and I chose this case because um, it's, a, it's a it's an interesting one because um, the top you know this is one case where I kind of demonstrate kind of a transition from my old fp3 into an fp1 it all kind of happened in a one patient during that period of time so i think it will be very interesting so who's joining us here tonight we got paul we got uh anis jackie kay han uh and we also have a sangu and tb back and mustafa all right thank you everybody for uh joining us live tonight uh i will keep the recorded version for those of you who cannot join because of the time differentials all right I'll keep it till probably tomorrow but you and I we both know the most fun stuff happened during the live session and what happens live stays live at the late coffee show so let's start okay let's switch over I'm going to go to a PIP hope everybody can see hey Lisa hey Jean all right people joining from Calgary Okay, Chilliwack, oh fantastic. I'm just going to have to pop you guys up here. Right there, hello, hello. And the Chilliwack and Calgary, oh wow, Maple Ridge. Wonderful, from Vancouver. Okay, let's uh, start this right here. Hope everybody can hear me okay. All right, so let's talk about full arch therapy, right? Um, As many of you know, uh, I do a fair amount of full arches. I do enough of share. We do about 100 arches uh, per year, and we've been doing at that rate for the past 10 years. Uh, we've uh, done total of probably 1,200, 1,300 full arches in my career. Uh, but uh, I must say things has evolved quite a bit, at least for my practice over the years. And uh, this is going to be a little bit of a continuation. Those of you who joined my last episode number nine, where I've answered uh, some of the common questions, what FP1, FP2, FP3 is. <clears throat> so I'm just going to briefly review. FP1 is basically like when we do prosthetics, uh, we're just mostly replacing missing teeth, not much of a missing gum. Uh, when a patient is presented to you with uh, you know most of the intact tissue and the, the bone height, we can do an FP1, which in my opinion is the most uh, ideal, most uh, conservative, and you're not really destroying much of the existing uh, biology of the patient. On the other side, on the right side of this screen, as you can see, would be FP3. Uh, FP3 is a fixed prosthetic category 3 where when the patient is coming to you with a lot of a tissue missing you have to replace not only the teeth but also the tissue and the bone as well okay so that's the situation um so and if I were to show you right here uh, this is just a schematic diagram is uh, you know Dr. Carl Mish used to uh, refer to this a lot so the conventional full fix you know like all on X you know when, we, when whenever you uh, see a post where they talk about bone reduction for the full arches you can pretty much uh, bet your morning donut that it's going to be FP3 fixed prosthetic 3 because they're reducing the bone to create a room for the teeth and the pink and all this and as I mentioned to you before one of the main reason why we used to have to reduce bone is to create a space for bar structure for hybrid and also 
um, for the strength of uh, interim prosthesis, which is pretty much made out of uh, denture teeth, right? And, and as you know, dentures, you get strength from thickness, okay? So that's the situation. Um, where I have moved away from is I tried to do uh, a minimal bone reduction or ZBR. That's my concept. I coined the ZBR zero bone reduction concept. So that's uh, that's the the direction that I start to go uh, starting few years. And to do that, I had to rely on guided surgery and I had to rely heavily on uh, um, more precise uh, treatment planning. So that has evolved over the last few years, and I don't think I'm quite there yet. I we're still doing a lot of um, fair number of research and development um, in our in-house lab, so that I can come up with the workflow to help um, other dentists uh, who wants to do full eye treatment, whether you're a prosthodontist, periodontist, oral surgeon, or uh, a general dentist who are capable at doing these type of uh, surgeries, um, you know, what you really need is a prosthetic workflow, uh, which is the hard part, because right now how it stands, uh, the, the workflow is pretty much limited to practice like myself, where you have an in-house lab and the technician to do it. So we're working on a way to more generalize this uh, workflow, it's coming. Let's talk about this patient here then. This patient uh, came to me, I think 2019, with uh, obviously failing a lot of teeth, uh, top and the bottom, but her primary concern was the top. Um, and as I'll mention to you, uh, you know, throughout the, the presentation that sometimes you come up with uh, most ideal um, most complete treatment plan you should always do that even though patient may not be able to afford to do it um, they might not have the resources or not not ready to do it but I think it's always worthwhile to uh, present the most ideal treatment plan and this case I can you know it's not a most ideal case I could have done things better but you know that's why I share it right so that uh, you know I can uh, learn from my mistakes and you know I reflect my own cases uh, that's one thing that I do a lot in my practice we take a lot of photos and we we uh, document a lot um, not necessarily for me to like present it every single case to you because you know I don't have time to do that but I, I I go back and look at those cases and reflect self reflect and see you know how I would do it differently if I were to turn back the time, right? And this was one of those cases I felt that it was worthwhile for me to, you know, share with you guys, okay? First of all, as you can see, it's a terminal dentition. And second is advanced heart and soft tissue losses. You know, you can see that it's quite significant in posterior. You got so much recession. A lot of tissue and heart tissue, soft tissue and heart tissue losses, right? And deep overbite. This is a problem. <clears throat> And this is a case this will come to haunt me uh, a little later as so I will <coughs> talk, talk uh, more in depth about this case. All right. <clears throat> so if you look at it, not only you see this advanced bone losses, but also uh, the deep bite the patient has. So ideally, if you're going to redo this case with a full arch we we want to give patient more long-term uh, friendly occlusion okay I don't want to copy exact occlusion the patient already had because obviously one of the reason why uh, the patient's uh, failure is because of the, the you know uh, the, the occlusion uh, that's not the most ideal so here's an x-ray here, and I've included a time st stamp here. It was 2019, January, the patient uh, came to see me. So right now it's 2021, so it's about a year ago, right? So this case spans over a year, and I'll tell you right now, we're not even done yet. <laughs> okay, still ongoing. Okay, so um, as you can see right here, if I have to blow it up a little bit, 
the white line here represents the amount of bone losses that I can trace down. But more importantly is this green line right here. This is the, the occlusion, uneven occlusion. Okay, Dr. Albert Louis will call it aggressive occlusion. Deep overbite, class two tendency. And you know, I mean, I guess you could save maybe a couple teeth here and maybe some tooth here, but overall, I think most of you will agree that this is a full arch treatment, top and the bottom, and that's what we presented actually. However, long story short, patient was not able to afford top and the bottom, okay? Um, she wanted us to start the top first and then later on start the bottom and and I accepted it and I think that was my first mistake. That was my first mistake. Um, I should have done was try to convince the patient to get both done or at least have top and bottom teeth extracted and have a patient with a lower overdenture option or something more affordable. Um, but that would have still able for me to do a proper um, design of the teeth and the occlusion. But I made a stupid mistake by keeping the lower and I tried to figure a way to work around it. Okay. And at this time, due to the amount of, oops, sorry, due to the amount of bone dis, uh, deficiency, I was planning to do some uh, bone reduction <clears throat> at that time. Um, and place the traditional all on X by tilting the, the, the implant front of the sinus and four implants and at the back to however I wanted to add some bone grafting and place these two implants and bury it so that the final prosthetic is going to be on six implant not four but the, the teeth in a day uh, bridge will be acrylic bridge uh, loading on four teeth Okay, I'll show you. And whenever you're tilting the implant, you need to incorporate multi-unit abutment to compensate, compensate for the angular differentials, right? So this is a multi-unit abutment. And they come in 17, 0 degrees, 17 degrees, and 30 degrees, okay? There you go. So this is a screw within the screw system, right? That's one of the downside. The, the idea is brilliant. But as I mentioned to you before, it's got its issues. Uh, not a short-term issue, but long-term issue of the micro gap uh, causing a perimplantitis. Those of you who are trying to challenge me that, no, you know, MUA, there's no literature supporting that, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Kipridge study in the Germany, you know, they didn't study the MUA. Well, you know what, MUA is a plug-in connection, okay? And those of you who's doing a lot of uh, FP3 cases, okay, don't lie to yourself. You know when you remove those prosthetics annual basis to do hygiene, there's a crap lot of stuff underneath it, right? Okay, so, okay, stop denying it. <laughs> All right, so let's look at this over here. So this one here, FP3, if I were to do this case again, would I do FP3? Probably not. I'll probably do an FP1. Now that I've done enough of FP1 teeth next day, I'm pretty confident that I can rebuild those bone and put the implant straight up and down and go fixture level. And I know that deep inside that that would be the more ideal treatment in my hands, okay? But at that time, I was still going through the transitions. And this is how we propose to put the implants in, right? sinus grafting on the bilateral sinus, SA3, and put the implants in an angle and bury the back. So took those teeth out. So if this is interesting though, if you look at it, right? Most of the teeth are, has lost a lot of attachment, right? There's hardly any attachment here, except these two teeth maybe, okay? Right, but rest of it is heavily periodontally uh, involved. Now, Traditional way to do an FP3, because when I first started doing uh, traditional all on four type of concept starting about 15, 16 years ago, which originated from Portugal by Dr. Paloma Lo, 
it was heavily denture driven okay yeah, and this is one of one of the underlying problem and there's many of uh, doctors uh, for getting into an all alone x treatment this is how they will be taught right first make the denture right take the impression of the patient get their bite and make the denture and that's what the problem is this is an immediate denture that means it's never been tried in in the patient's mouth before so so what it is is you don't know how well it's going to fit you don't know how whether it's going to look good right if the occlusion is going to be right that's a big guess guessing part okay if the patient came with edentulus and then when you, you get it to a try in those cases are a lot more easier but a lot of my cases patients they come with a terminal dentition and they don't want to go through the denture phase right that's why this all on x teeth in a day teeth in a day concept was so popular because you are basically targeting those patients to bypass having to wear dentures you see it's a psychological uh, marketing um, people might not want to admit it but that's what it was so what this here is we make this reduction window okay reduction window the buckle and you measure about six millimeter from the cej of the teeth and that's how much you need to minimum and minimum you need to remove the bone to allow the future bar structure and the thickness of the interim um, acrylic denture so that it doesn't break okay and also if the patient has really high smile line you have to even reduce more right so it's, it's a lot of bone reduction and here if you can see here and i've uh, placed a six implant the back ones are buried and on the day of the surgery i'm taking the impression so that i can pick up the back one there's different ways to do it but this is how i did it i picked up the front in the mouth the other two in the model it's more uh refined way of picking it up okay anyways uh one of the take home uh, today is a lot of uh, uh, a surgeon say you know what well, what do you do with the excessive tissue when you do a bone reduction fp3 i don't cut away this palatal tissue what i do is i buckle you roll it over and i put a tissue punch in these uh, areas so that palatal tissue which is heavily cretinized is going to be useful uh, once the area heals up okay so it's a very good trick uh, to uh, utilize when you're doing a lot of bone reduction cases okay so this was 2019 guys 2019 february the 13th okay that's a timestamp stamp right there and then two weeks post up which is a uh, uh, february the 28th and this x-ray is and this here is uh, uh there you go this is a converted denture okay at mua level right here and the back ones is, as you can see i did a sinus grafting lateral window and then there's a cover screw and i buried it okay and these heal pretty well the reason is because there's no pressure from the denture because this is converted bridge right so these he heal nicely unhindered so in this case i only had like a one or two millimeter bone uh so like holding the denture from falling into the sinus if this was a full denture maybe there's a pressure here they can this can fall into the sinus but because there's no pressure from the overlying uh prosthetic because it's fixed uh, they heal pretty well so basically I've done the sinus lifting. I buried the back one. Six megagen any one implants were used at that time. Uh, and the four implants at the front was used at an MUA level to make an FP3 denture converted bridge. Okay, now this is a problem, right? This is the problem. The problem is that because the denture was never tried in, <laughs> never tried in, and we wanted to lessen the deep bite. Our denturist um, made this denture, but there was some guesswork, right? So by the time we converted the denture, everything teeth were too short. And amount of the bone that I reduced, I did not take into consideration of that teeth will be moved up, right? So that six millimeter bone reduction just was not enough. Okay, I should have reduced a lot more. Now I ended up with teeth are higher up 
and not enough structure for my acrylic and this bridge is going to be very prone to fracture during the healing time okay and I still didn't get the occlusion correct the teeth are too even moved up too much the reality is that it should have been proper diagnosis that the mandibular soft tissue is a gummy smile that should be intruded right so this really should have been a double arch case from a get-go however the great thing about these full arch cases that two weeks healing is amazing right okay and here is that rollover uh, palatal flap that I show you right here okay okay now that has become a very nice thick curtainized gingiva okay all right and those are multi-unit abutments so what I did was after a few weeks after the tissues healed um, I decided to make a new temporary bridge all on four bridge okay uh, because I was so unhappy with the uh, the design of the uh, teeth in a day uh, bridge so uh, what we did was we had the models and what we did was design with a CAD cam and decided to make a little bit better looking um, bridge and we used our in-house uh, milling unit to do that <clears throat> five months later what we did was we exposed the back implants okay so now it's a 2019 July the 5th isn't it July the 5th okay so July the 5th and that's uh, pretty much about six months uh, almost seven months into the game and the back implants is healed up nicely okay and I've exposed it placed a straight multi-unit abutment and put a multi-unit abutment cover screw or healing cap and I sutured it with a chromic gut okay so this is how the x-ray looks like right here okay so top is yeah by the def definition is an fp3 okay and I don't know if you can see carefully here uh, I had to relieve a little bit of the cantilever of the uh, PMMA bridge as you can see right here okay otherwise it will not seat right so when you're exposing and placing a multi unit abutment you need to relieve that okay so these are the little things that at, at the courses they don't really tell you about it uh, when you see a lot of uh, uh, these uh, full arch cases not too many uh, uh, presenters uh, you know you know give you the detail right so these are the little detail thing that you need to do another thing is look at this okay this is a perfectly properly designed fp3 uh, conventional uh, by definition but look at it patient uses a water pick every day but still stuff gets in there so you know, and I see these type of uh, cases all the time whenever we bring patients back every six months for a hygiene we remove the bridge to check how the plaque accumulation is and uh, and and we see these you know, quite often so i come to realize that uh, water pick alone is not enough okay and this is uh 2019 september right september uh, our prosthetic team was ready to take impression okay all right oh there's a question there from Anis yeah yeah also you guys don't be afraid to uh, ask me questions right I can stop and uh, ask questions anytime so uh, thanks for asking so Anis says when you let me post this uh, question right up here it says when you roll the palatal tissue over the buckle do you need to apically reposition the buckle flap or does a appliance supply enough to pressure to stabilize yeah that's the answer appliance is enough appliance does all the trick that you need to do you don't need to do a uh, you know blind suture anchoring mucosal to the uh, you don't have to do those kind of a perio suturing it will be loosey-goosey but that's okay you roll over the pallet to the buckle suture what you can and push down with the uh, the bridge and the compression from that is going to allow proper healing so hope that answers the question okay all right so Oh, let's get back to right here so September my prosthetic team was taking the impression and something happened okay something happened a miracle happened okay the miracle was bottom bridge big start to bother the patient okay 
Okay, bottom bridge started to bother the patient. No sang. Um, top is not a fixture level impression. Um, let me go back. Was it a fixture level impression? This one? No, that's a MUA level. That's an MUA level impression. Okay, yeah. So the bottom side to bridge. Break. So my prosthetic doctor, Dr. Daniel Kim, said, uh, patient wants to do the bottom now. I said, yes. <laughs> but can you imagine if we made a final on the top with that, that curve, Rocky Mountain curvature, and then a year later, patient wanted to do the bottom. Oh, my God. Okay, the money and the energy that we've wasted, right? So we're still at the temporary phase, right? And patient, we can do the bottom now, finally, because it's bothering her. And we can design the top and the bottom and give her a proper upper and lower temporary with the proper design that I wanted from the beginning. Okay, you get it, right? Now in the 2020, January the 15th. So look at this, right? This was my temporary on the top and the bottom and with this ugly curvature, right? Okay, something just doesn't look right. So what my plan to do now is to do a little bit of an alveoloplasty, okay? Just at the top there for the purpose of positioning the new teeth more at the even occlusion, right? That's what I want and I want to place the implant on the bottom. Now we're gonna do FP1 now, right? I'm not gonna do FP3. Minimal bone reduction. I'm gonna put the implant on the first molar and the first premolar and the canine and the canine and the first premolar and the molar. So in Canadian number is a six, four, three, three, four, six. Don't ask me what it is in American number, okay? <laughs> so 20 something and 30 something, I don't know, okay. But basically it's a canine, first premolar, and the first molar, uh, because my goal for this case was canine to canine will be a, one, a six unit bridge, and the uh, first premolar to the to the first molar will be a, another a bilateral bridge. So three segmented bridge is what I had in mind. Uh, why didn't I put it on the uh, lateral? Sometimes I do, but there, there was just a lot of infection there. Kind of, I kind of wanted to avoid that. Okay, so so that's what I decided to do. Okay. Thank you very much, okay? Anthony, thank you, my brother. 19, 21, 22, 27, 28, 30. There you go. I owe you one, okay? <laughs> All right. So on the top, uh, what my technician did before the surgery. So we've designed the top and the bottom CAT cam now. We're going to CAT cam, okay? No more dentures, just CAT cam. We've milled the top uh, and then We've used that milled bridge, new bridge. We made a bottom teeth, right? And we got the bite out of that and to make the surgical guide, okay? Surgical guide. So the idea is we're gonna remove all the bottom teeth, remove her old PMMA bridge down, put the new PMMA bridge on the top, which has a proper curvature, proper curvature, right? Okay and put the surgical guide and get the bite to bite down so that I can position the implant in the most ideal place, right? All right, so bottom teeth, okay, rip them out, okay. How I extract the bottom bridge, okay, I'll show you, tell you a little trick, okay. I don't section the bridge. I get a drill, I cut the neck right under the crown, okay? Because a lot of these teeth are periodontally compromised. I can just cut them at the right below at the CJ right here, okay? So section, 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 and then pop those bridges out, okay? And goes down to the recycle bin, and the rest of them still have enough to structure for you to use a forcep or elevator to take those out, okay? These teeth took me less than 10 minutes to take out altogether. Okay. I, I extract teeth very, very quickly. That together with the power elevator, you know, they're out in no time, five to 10 minutes, okay? So these are out. And, okay, the bridges, after the surgery, we pick up the position, and over the night, we mill the top and the bottom, okay? 
and in the morning uh, next day well after the surgery patient goes home the surgery actually only took like two hours right and then uh, we do the refine the design and then we mill it overnight and then Shelly who's our acrylist she's an amazing acrylic I call her the queen of acrylic <laughs> okay she's so good and she does the pink work okay and then she does the fits the all the uh, these uh, links okay the tie bases top and the bottom you see the difference here this is really really good uh, slide it tells you my idea my vision my what I define proper long-term hygienic bridge design is okay even though this is a temporary this bridge okay this is how the final should be as well okay because if you design bridge this way the patient you don't have to remove them every six months or a year during your hygiene visit because this is a proxa friendly proxa brush friendly you got open embrasure so you can put the uh, proxa brush through water pick can go underneath too basically patient can keep them very very clean okay if the fp3 bridge is not like this if it's compressing the tissue okay in my opinion it's not a right design anymore okay and i've done so many of those okay so many of those and i'm trying to tell my colleagues that stop making design like that Okay, FP3 should have a space for embrasure space for uh, proxy brushes. Okay, so see the difference. Top was bone reduction, bottom no reduction. Well, I reduced a little bit in the interior so that teeth can be in the right position. But this is a teeth next day PMMA. Okay, all right. And this is the next day. Okay, FP1 on the bottom, FP3, and the zero bone reduction. Uh, Oh, actually, top one is not ZBR. Top one did have a bone reduction. That was 2019, so that's some misprint, okay? Yeah. With my design, my workflow, never have to worry about occlusion. It's almost always perfect. It's next day, okay? Yeah. So it's right on the money. This is a teeth next day. Patient just had a surgery the day before. The reason they don't swell up much is because there's no bone reduction on the bottom, right? Top surgery was done about a year ago. Bottom surgery was the only thing that was done the day before. And because um, there's hardly any flap, because we're not doing any bone reduction, that's another advantage, okay? The, the healing is incredibly fast. And then, yeah, this is uh, uh, January 23rd. X-ray, post-op X-ray, new bridge on the top, new bridge on the bottom, and new bridge on the top. You still have a suture there, so I think this is a two weeks post-op. We remove the suture at the two weeks post-op. Okay, these are PTFE CS06 uh, premium suture. Uh, I don't know what the number is in U USB uh, 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 number, but you know it's a, a Cytoplast CS06 uh, premium. And it heals wonderful. It's fantastic, right? However, okay, in May, in May, when we were trying to get close to uh, uh, going to the final bridge, patients start to have a complaint about the swelling on the bottom left, okay? Swelling on the bottom left. Uh, this implant was getting infection, okay? Why is that? Okay, why is that? I'll show you a little bit later. So what I did was I took that implant out and then replanted with newer implant, slightly wider. Okay, and put a healing abutment. I cut the cantilever here, okay, so that this implant was not loaded on that surgery day of replantation. Okay. All right. Patient still has a temporary bridge, top and the bottom. And as you can see right here, that's a new implant healing pretty good you see what the problem is right here you see what the problem is there's no attached gingiva okay no vestibular depth right so this patient needs fgg a lot of it a lot of it not so much over here because we had a palate rollover right from the palate look how thick that the tissue is top front 
you don't need FGG because we did that palate tissue rollover. But on the bottom, we hardly cut any bone and there was no proper cranial tissue anywhere to start with, right? So these patients need FGG. So when you're doing uh, these cases, flush cases, um, consider, take consideration of doing FGG procedures, okay? I typically charge enough for these cases so that I can do FGG uh, uh, and no charge, okay? I don't like to nickel and dime. I don't like to add additional procedures in the middle of the courses. I just honor what I charge them and then I just do them because it doesn't take me that long to do FGG, okay? And I'll show you how I do it, okay? It takes me 10 minutes, okay? So uh, my prosthetic doctor and our lab they took impression and <laughs> they took a pen to check the fitting of the, the, the abutment on the top. But everything um, uh, was going good and we do the zirconia milling we also have a zirconia milling machine so we mill the zirconia the thing about zirconia is when you mill it it's huge okay it's like humongous in size and when you go into sintering it starts to shrink right it's just amazing technology right when you mill it you have to compensate for the shrinkage and each of these um uh, uh blocks come with uh, like a coating so that when you put that that block in the, the milling machine, it reads it, it compensates for the shrinkage. It's just, it's just amazing, okay? And the fit is so good. Um, but they're making the top and, and, and the bottom to uh, for the final, but I told them, you know what, hold on, uh, making the final because I wanna do some final, uh, free gingival grafting for the patient, right? Right, because the tissue will always be the issue, right? Like I told you, right? So. I'm going to explain to you about sutureless FGG, okay? Sutureless FGG, and this has really changed my soft grafting uh, practice, okay? I mean, I'm not a periodontist, okay? So I'm not gonna teach you like fancy FGG, uh, how to do those, okay? You, I'll leave that to Jeff or Dimitri or Sergey, right? Okay, those guys uh, teach a lot of our soft tissue courses, but if you want to learn, um, free gingival grafting and doesn't have to look pretty just have to work function and do quickly because I can do free gingival quick, uh, as quickly as anybody I'll show you and what I learned from is professor Diaz Son he's a renowned oral surgeon in South Korea And he calls it a, a sutureless FGG. This is it, okay? I freeze the patient in an area where there's a minimal tet gingiva and low vestibule, okay? And for me, if the patient has a tet gingiva but, but, but low vestibule, I still do FGG. If the patient has a decent vestibule, but no tet gingiva, I still do FGG, but the reality is a lot of these edentulous uh, flush cases patient is lacking vestibular depth and FGG because of the uh, parental disease, right? So what do I do is I always use autogenous tissue. I do not use commercial tissue, okay? I don't think they work for long term. Uh, so what I do is I use a pocket knife, okay? This is not true. I don't use this 15 to harvest palate. Okay, it takes me too long. I use a pecan knife. Okay, Dr. Jin is going to show you at the study club, live surgery study club. I think it's coming in some time. Uh, not maybe the session two, CTG. He also used that pecan knife, special knife. Uh, it's a secret knife, okay, but we'll, we'll show you how to do it. And use a pecan knife to harvest from here to here in a one slice, just a single slice. Literally takes me 10 seconds to harvest, okay? And then you take the, the, the slice deep enough to get enough tissue, but shallow enough so that it doesn't hit any of the major artery. And as soon as I harvest that, before the bleeding starts to happen, you know, like when you do a, do a harvesting, it doesn't bleed right away. It takes a few seconds, right? It's almost like a tissue, remove it, like palatal tissue doesn't know what to do and then it takes about 10, 15 seconds and start to bleed, okay. As soon as you slice it out, 
before it starts to bleed, you get your cyanoacrylate ready and start to, to put on top of it and quickly air dry and stops the bleeding just like that. Okay. Okay, so 10 second slice. Okay, cyanoacrylate, blow air, half a minute, you're done. Okay, harvesting is done. Okay, here I took enough, right? Because I'm doing like three or four teeth here. And then I use a 15 blade to do the scoring, right? Partial thickness scoring. Okay. And then what I use is I use a monofilament. Okay. Dissolving suture. Half circle to take a bite, take a bite, take a bite. Okay. And then you get a tension free, right? And immobilize recipient bed. And then I take this thing and I just glue it onto the bed using cyanoacrylate. Okay. This whole procedure took me literally 10 minutes, right? This is how I can do bilateral free gingival grafting. Sometimes I do like all quadrant at one time, right? Okay. And sometimes I run out of the, the FGG donor tissue. Then that's when I do a split. Okay. Uh, what does a uh, uh, Rustam call it? Rustam calls it a, uh, uh, there's, a there's a cute name for it. For, for it. Anyways, but uh, yeah, I can slice it and I can half it and things like that. So there's many different tricks to do it, okay? Um, are you worried about talking about the lower PMMA two weeks post implant for suture removal? Are you worried about taking out the bridge? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. There's this, there's this uh, uh, misunderstanding, okay? There's this uh, misunderstanding about misunderstanding about you know if you take the bridge out during that first four weeks you know you're weakening the uh, the implant because the curvature comes down where the implant is weaker that thing is like a 20 year old theory man okay All right 20 year old people are still citing that curvature we've proven with a, a great fourth titanium uh, a dual surface treatment the sand blasting and acid etching there is no dip there isn't. It just keeps on going up. There's no dip, guys. Okay? So any of the instructors are still talking about be very careful during the second week to sixth week about uh, dipping. Okay? Forget about it. That theory don't hold anymore. It doesn't hold any water. Okay? That's why in Korea, with a dual edges, uh, they've that study, they're loading with a final prosthetic for the single tooth in a healthy bone in six to eight weeks, final crown goes in. Okay? So... Uh, I, I don't worry about it, not at all. If you have a good initial torque and good ISQ value, okay, uh, you don't have to worry about removing it because you're not going to lose implant, right? Yes, strip FGG. That's it, Sango. Thank you very much, okay? Thank you. Strip FGG is, uh, that was the right uh, name, okay? Yeah, you strip it, okay? That's how you get most volume out of it, right? Okay, so that was before, that's after. Finally, I got what I want, okay, after almost two years, and we're still not done. So patient is going to come, I think, next week or something like that, week after, for me to do uh, all three teeth or four teeth here, and all three or four teeth here, I'm going to be doing it all one sitting, all one sitting. I'm going to get a bilateral harvesting of the palate using a paquette knife, knife, and I'll be, she'll be booked one hour, and I'll be do, able to do the whole thing, freezing, right down to finishing okay sutureless fgg all right uh yeah very very uh useful powerful uh, soft tissue grafting technique it's not pretty right okay nothing fancy like i showed you right there's nothing fancy about it there's no fancy suture to show off or anything like that but it works so that's that okay hopefully uh um uh, you guys uh, uh enjoyed uh, tonight's session okay um yeah and uh, a lot of the cases that I do now, and my office is FP1. Uh, we haven't done FP3 in a long run, and also I've stayed away from uh, MUA uh, con uh, connection. We're going fixture level, and our final bridges are typically segmented into uh, three sections or sometimes four sections. In average, I place implants straight up and down, six to eight implants, okay? Yeah, depending on the quality of the bone and the availability of the bone and all that stuff, right? So hopefully uh, some of you found that uh, tonight's session are uh, useful, okay? 
Uh, I know this is not the topic that's for everybody, but even if you don't do full large cases, I think it's useful to know and how the things are progressing. I know still out there, majority of the, the surgeons are doing uh, uh, FP3 and bone reduction, reduction guide and everything. Uh, the funny thing is the way I used to do it 15 years ago, it was such a revolutionary, it was a paradigm shift and people, uh, you know, regarded what I do, uh, experimentation, okay? But fast forward now, 15 years, uh, you know, what I used to do is a mainstream and what I'm doing now, FP1, is something that, you know, a lot of people have a hard time accepting. Um, but I think, you know, FP1, minimal reduction, minimal uh, violation of the patient's biology, I think it is the right way to do it, okay? And I hope to come up with a proper workflow so that you can do it or your referral surgeon can do it and 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 the doctors can general dentist or prosthodontist or periodontist can uh, team up with um, a good cat cam lab to give these uh, good results right one thing cannot deny is that cat cam computer digital uh, is is a future guided is not just about guided surgery but more importantly guided prosthetics so hope you guys enjoyed it you guys, uh, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, really uh, enjoy the Sunday uh, late night coffee show. Uh, next Sunday, I'm going to take a break because me and sang we have to prepare for comprehensive implant residency uh, uh, lecture. And due to the uh, pandemic situation, uh, we have to do some uh, 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 live uh, uh, recordings and everything. We're going to prepare some extra work. So we'll be spending a lot of time on that. So we're, we're going to take a break next Sunday, but the Sunday afterwards, uh, we're going to do a Ask Me Anything, uh, episode 11. So if you guys have any question, just private message me at Messenger, okay? Uh, any question that you want me to cover at the, the next session, uh, 11, okay? And I'll do my best to cover the best way I can, all right? Uh, will you be able to give us a rough estimate on the cost to the patient for such an awesome treatment? Uh, rough estimate, we're looking at, I think, FP1 six implants uh, if does not require any major grafting we're looking at about 28 to about thirty thousand dollars Canadian okay 28 to about thirty thousand dollars Canadian uh, thirty thousand being a little bit of a higher end uh, 28 being a bit of a uh, an average um, so yeah in that in that in that range okay so uh, yeah hopefully uh, I don't know how much that is in American okay I don't think American doctors will be referring me cases uh, you know at this time <laughs> time so in Canadian is that's the rough cost okay hope you guys enjoy it take care and you know see you guys uh, uh, soon awesome bye bye